here with Chief Tim Milligan from the City of Marietta Fire Department, and we're talking about emergency vehicle response.
afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the afternoon session. Maybe afternoon, maybe not for you all. It is the 1230 Eastern Time session here for the IMSA virtual conference. I'm Toby Cummings, the executive director of IMSA, and I'm glad you're here. A couple of housekeeping tips for you all if you're new to joining us after uh, day one. Very bottom of your screen, the chat option will give you the op option to toggle to panelists and participants. We ask you to do that so that all the folks can see what you're chatting about. Q&A is down there as well. If you have questions later on, we will be facilitating questions for our speakers today through the Q&A section so we answer all of your information. Looking forward to the session this afternoon. I've seen a preview of it and I'm super excited. So without further ado, so they can use all of this time valuably, uh, please welcome Peter Ashley. Hi everybody, my name is Peter Ashley. Welcome to the IATL, the Infrastructure Automotive Technology Laboratory. Today I'm joined by uh, Walt Townsend, <laughs> who's the VP of uh, Applications Development for Applied Information. And uh, today's session, we're gonna be talking about connected vehicle preemption and intersection communication. So, Walt, when we start talking about connected vehicle preemption, what is emergency vehicle preemption? And how does it work in a connected vehicle environment? Well, connection vehicle preemption is when we get signals from the OBUs on the vehicles, transmit that by several means to the intersections, and then have the intersection uh, respond to that to apply it to, to give the emergency vehicle a green light. Okay, and, and the whole idea behind this is so that we can basically give emergency vehicles green lights all the time. Um, how, how do you do that in a, in a situation like a city where there's so many different configurations and things like that? How do you make something flexible in that way? Um, we have a unit that goes in the cabinet that understands the connected vehicle protocols and also knows all the drivers to talk to all the different traffic controllers. So we make it simple to interface to all different types of equipment in the cabinet by running it through one box that knows the protocols. And then for traffic signals or, or mm -hmm. the, the approach that he's coming from, mm -hmm. how does it know mm -hmm. which direction he's coming from and all the rest? What is the kind of technology that you're utilizing there? So we pick up location from the vehicles as they're approaching, uh, whether it's connected vehicle messages or various types of messaging coming in. We get that to the cabinet unit over uh, either direct communication or cellular communication. And then each cabinet unit has a set of rules in it where you can draw the zones, the approach zones that you want um, that um, tell it what, what preempt to apply to the controller or what message to send to the controller based on uh, where the vehicle is approaching from. Okay, well, I think, you know, what I'm going to do is, I'm, uh, you know, the, the idea of today's session is it's going to be very interactive. So everybody, if you've got questions, please go ahead, type mm -hmm. them in, ask the questions. We've got one of the predominant experts on emergency vehicle preemption and intersection mm -hmm. communication here with Walt. <laughs> so I want you to try stump him on all the hard <laughs> questions. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to show a couple of slides that we're going to help us talk through a couple of the topics. And then we're gonna take a walk around here and have a look at the physical equipment as well. So I've, I've got a couple of slides here that I'm just gonna basically pull up and you're gonna be able to see some of, the, some of the information here. So what's important is, as Walt was talking about, there's two forms of communication. So, or three. We're obviously getting the position from the vehicle from the GPS and then we're utilizing two forms of communication, cellular and short range radio. Now short range radio can be 900 megahertz radio, DSRC, CV2X, but the important thing is we're utilizing short range radio and cellular communication because then you have redundancy that's built into your system. And this is a very important thing. So you're getting the GPS position from the vehicle over here, from the GPS satellites, and it's broadcasting the message with direct radios to the intersection controller over here. But at the same time, it's sending the information up the cellular network to the cloud and back down to the intersection. What's important about that second link is you can communicate to intersections here, 
intersections here and on the left and on the right of the of the vehicle why that's important is often you've got hills you've got buildings you've got turns you've got short intersections away from each other so what what we do in connected vehicle intersections um, is we hook into the left turn indicator and the right turn indicator and the emergency lights and we track which direction it's going to go so when he has his left turn indicator on we actually tell that intersection up there hey the emergency vehicle is coming your way start flushing out all the traffic and then he ends up flushing out that traffic out of the way of the emergency vehicle to actually prepare it the gps is also really important because every single emergency vehicle um, event always starts with a um, a event happening within the fire station now generally when you're in a fire station you don't have gps signal it works the same as your normal gps from your garmin or your tom tom so you can't get connection what we do is is you know all these new modern autonomous driving vehicles have come out with this great new technology where they can track vehicles even when there's no um, no GPS signal so that actually allows us to track them indoors so as soon as they turn on the emergency lights it starts talking to that first intersection and when you use the cellular aspect behind it it um, it, uh, when you use the cellular aspect behind it, it also connects to the um, emergency um, intersections ahead. So that's actually preparing the signal and you turn your left turn indicator on and then it can actually trigger two or three intersections ahead. That's actually going to cause a, um, you know, cause all those intersections ahead to actually change. Even before the line of sight technology can even see the intersection. So it's the range that's important. Gives it more time to clear out the traffic. Do you want to explain that a little bit more in detail? Sure. Um, the line of sight technologies, whether it's uh, uh, DSRC or 900 megahertz or whatever, typically are only going to give us about a 900 foot, 1,000 foot range, sometimes 1,500 foot range. That's only 10 or, seconds, 10 or 15 seconds advance notice for the intersection. We'd like to give that intersection more time. It, uh, to get ready to flush out the queue, it may take the intersection 10 or 15 seconds just to get through its safety timings and get to a green on the dwell phase for the preamp. We usually like to have another 20 seconds ahead of that, so we usually set a 30 or 40 second ETA for the emergency vehicle so that there's time for that queue to get moving in front of the fire truck so that by, by the time the fire truck gets there, the traffic's already rolling and the fire truck can roll right through. Uh. How did the older technology work? Let's say you've got an optical solution, which most cities have. Yeah. Um, how does that compare to using the cellular aspect and, and you know, how, how yeah. far away would it the, actually connect? The, the optical, if you have good line of sight, is good for maybe 1,400 feet. So again, that's 10, 12 seconds advance notice, which isn't really enough time to get you a good solid green before the truck gets there. So they're gonna find that as they come close to an intersection, there, there's a queue of traffic in front of them. Um, they're going to be slowing down and waiting for that traffic to get moving before they can even get close enough to the light to preempt it. Uh, but if we've preempted 30 seconds out, it's preempted it before they can even see the light. So. And there's been some situations like the city of Atlanta where they had incredibly long ped phases. Sure. Do you want to explain what that is and how we actually get around that? In a lot of cities, we're able to program the controllers to truncate the PED phases, or at least shorten the PED, even the PED clearance uh, can be very long in some of these cities with wide streets. Uh, here in Alpharetta, it can be 30 or 40 seconds. And um, it is acceptable, according to the MUTCD, to shorten that time when an emergency vehicle is, emergency vehicle is coming because you don't want a pedestrian standing out there in front of a fire truck. But there are some cities that are nervous about shortening that, don't really want to truncate that time. Uh, if that's the case, we can just set our ETA even longer to 40 or 50 seconds just to preempt even sooner so that as the fire truck is, you know, still almost a minute away from the intersection, 
you've already started that PED clearance counting down so that the PED can be cleared by the time the truck gets there. And, and that also works very well with um, transit signal priority. So even mm -hmm. more so because you want to send that signal a full cycle in advance when it comes to transit signal priority so that you right. can actually trigger that. Do you want to explain how we do that? Yeah, with transit signal priority, you want to get that notice that the vehicle is coming to the intersection as soon as possible. The sooner the intersection can start making adjustments, the less impact it has on each of the side streets because what it's going to do is shorten the side street phases so that it can get back around to a green for the approaching transit vehicle. And if you only give it 10 or 15 seconds notice, there's only so much it can do. It may have to take all that time out of one phase or it just may not even be able to get there in time. But if you can give it 30, 50, 60 seconds advance notice, it may just take five seconds out of three or four phases and then have enough time to get early, get there early for the transit vehicle and give it a green. So, and that also helps keep traffic signal controllers in coordination. Right. And that's a key aspect. So, you know, a big misnomer was if you do emergency vehicle preemption, were well, you really messing up traffic? How would you respond to that with modern traffic controllers now? Well, most traffic controllers recover pretty quickly after preemption. They have the ability to jump back into coordination right after the preempt occurs. But in transit signal priority, we have the ability to, to try to serve the vehicle without impacting coordination at all, without jumping out of coordination. Now, you still have the option to, to go a little bit beyond coordination if you want to, but it always keeps the cycle timer running so that it can always go right back into coordination when the vehicle is passed. So there's very little impact on the traffic from doing uh, TSP now, transit signal priority. The main impact is just a little bit of shortening on the side streets or maybe a, a delayed, um, an extension of the green on the main street just to get that vehicle through. But it all starts in getting information from the vehicle ahead of time so that you can provide that information mm -hmm to the vehicle, to the actual intersection with a 90 second ETA, for instance. Right, and you're probably approaching, you may have three or four intersections within that 90 second window. So if you're just broadcasting your BSMs or whatever from the vehicle, your location messages, all the intersections in range as determined by the router in the cloud, the, the message router, uh, it's going to be sending it to all those intersections. They can all start their processing concurrently as that vehicle gets closer to each of them. And obviously the whole thing is what you're wanting to do is you're wanting to uh, make the buses run more efficient. And this is a great way of doing it without impacting vehicles, uh, you know, the normal vehicle traffic because you're keeping everything in coordination. Right. Okay. Um, Maybe we're going to go back to uh, the screen over here and show you some more of the stuff from the central side. And when you, when you have a connected uh, intersection system, obviously every intersection is connecting. And you can see the intersections here on the uh, left-hand side. But you're also using Google Maps where you can see where all your traffic signal controllers are and all of your emergency vehicles. So there's an emergency vehicle, you know, all of them around here, and all of the traffic signals are all live on the map so you can actually get connected to all of them. This provides you obviously with a lot of additional information that you can track where the emergency vehicles are, and you can also um, provide a lot more information to the fire department um, in terms of, you know, if there's any intersection that has any issues that they should avoid, for instance, if there's a power failure at a traffic signal, because what will happen is one of those signals will get a big red ring around it when there's an error that occurs. This is actually a, a picture over here of, of city of Baton Rouge, very, very large deployment. They've got 460 traffic signals with 80 vehicles connected and obviously all of these are, are providing emergency vehicle preemption throughout the, throughout the city. We, you can also see some lines occurring here, like blue lines, and there should be some, some orange lines over here, um, which are actually showing live events versus just traveling around. So that's obviously providing uh, information. Is the emergency vehicle in an emergency situation, or are they just driving from one point to another um, the other aspect behind this, which the fire, the fire chiefs really like, is the ability of tracking 
how did their emergency vehicle respond to an incident? So once an incident happens and you go, well, what route did he actually take? Okay, you can go back to the, to the playback, you can select your date and your time, and you can select the vehicle, and then it's basically gonna start the vehicle over here and track him as he's going down, and you've got a little play, pause, and a, and a scroll bar over here, and the legend, so blue is idle, uh, orange is in service, Red is left turn active and in service, and right turn is yellow when you're active and in service. And this allows you to track where they're going, what they've done in during the day, and how they've responded to different events. This is also really useful to the traffic engineer because if they get a call from, say, a fire truck driver saying, hey, I didn't get a preempt yesterday when I did that run, uh, the traffic engineer can look back at the trail that that fire truck left, see what intersections it went through, and then look at see what those intersections did when the truck went through. Okay. So. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good good, so good it's not use just, of the data. It's not just tracking the drivers to watch them. It's also very useful in terms of making sure the system functions correctly. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show just a little bit of a video of a live uh, fire truck driving through some intersections so we can see how this stuff actually works in the field. So this is the city of Marietta and you'll see there's an emergency vehicle um, driving out of, the, out of the fire station here and I'm just going to pause because the first intersection is literally 500 feet away and it's actually prepared the first intersection as he's driving out. So as you continue driving, we're going to get connected and, you know, he comes out onto this first roadway, which is close to a very big connector here. And you'll see we've brought everybody else to a red and we've got the green left and the green straight active. Now, as you're driving all the way down here, what we've done is we've already started requesting the, tra the signal ahead and you'll see all of the signals, if I pause here, you actually see that the, the green is active and the left turn is active. So every other um, approach. approach is brought to a stop, a safe stop, so that the emergency vehicle can actually go through safely without having to worry about someone cutting across him. And you'll see we're driving through this signal and the very next signal is already, uh, has its, it's already you can see everybody stopped ahead and it's green for us. So this is, this is showing how we flushing all the traffic ahead and making it very, very safe for the emergency vehicle to get through and saving those crucial seconds. I'm just gonna hit pause here. We can see how we can't see the next signal ahead. It's around the corner and it's also over a hill. And the problem with that is, you know, on the traditional optical solutions or just pure radio-based solutions, you know, radio can't communicate over a hill and it can't communicate through buildings and the same thing with optical. So what would happen is you would come around the corner and then your, your vehicle would then see the signal and then it would only uh, put the priority or preemption request in and by then it's too late because you're going to stop for the vehicles ahead of you and the traffic signal is going to take 10 to 12 seconds to go through its clearance times. So this is actually providing um, uh, you know, providing that link through the cellular side that's brought everybody else already to a stop up ahead and allowing for a clear way through. Now the next thing you're going to see is connected vehicle technology which we'll show in a little, a little bit later in the presentation. Emergency vehicle approaching from behind. So we're getting a, an emergency vehicle approaching from behind alert there that's basically providing us with a message saying, or the public, that there's an emergency vehicle approaching from behind, watch out. And this is a great way because, you know, the cars are so well insulated now that people don't know what direction the emergency vehicle is coming from. So it will say emergency vehicle approaching from behind, from the right, from the left, from the front, so that you now know, all right, let's pull over before the emergency vehicle comes to let him through. You know, one of the biggest complaints we get from the fire department is people in the public 
um, panic when there's a emergency vehicle approaching. So this is one of those ways of getting the messages out to the public that the emergency vehicles are coming. So Walt, I, you know, what I would like to do is I'd like to also have you go and explain some of the data that's coming back mm -hmm. from these emergency vehicle systems and then we'll go do a little bit of a walk around the lab sure. and show some of the equipment. Mm -hmm. So the, the first thing that we've got, maybe I'll explain this one because it's so basic, I can explain it. <laughs> um, what it's showing is it's showing for the City of Odessa Fire Department, uh, how many idle trips did they do in the month of September? So they did 3,724. How many service trips did they do inside of the city limits? So one thing we split out is, are you doing a, an emergency trip within your city limits or is it a mutual aid call? Because that affects your average response times. So they did 923 and um, their average response time was three minutes and 36 seconds within the city limits. And they did 300 mutual aid calls and the average response time for that was seven minutes and seven seconds. Now you can also see the average speed because they traveled a shorter distance inside the city limits is far less than when they went further away where they're traveling a much further distance. One of the other things that the fire department is interested in is how much availability do I have of my fleet? So right now they've got an 81% availability with their current usage of their fleet. And another important thing is the 90th percentile information. So, you know, what is the, um, the trip time for the 10% of the longest trips that you're doing? So do we need to build more fire stations? And then we get into data such as, you know, uh, a heat map of where all the emergency trips are happening. So, you know, month, uh, day of the month, time of the day up at the top. And then you can zoom in and see, um, you know, here on Sunday uh, at 2 p.m. We had 20 emergency vehicle trips happening in that time. So they can also look at this information, and say, when should we go and uh, have our people um, you know, situated in the fire department with the maximum usage and it's obviously, you know, between seven o'clock and eight o'clock in the evening. Now, we also go into more details of every single trip and so on. And then we go into the interesting stuff that the traffic department and Walt finds really interesting, <laughs> which is going into the information of, you know, what is the vehicle actually seeing? So what is happening on the intersection down at the intersection level? And Walt, you tell me which one to look at over here. Engine 663, is that a good one to look at or? Sure, and what we're showing here is just that the, the systems that, uh, that are handling the calls from the vehicles, uh, the device in the cabinet is also monitoring what the traffic controller is doing. It's doing it in a very simple way. It's just monitoring the green so that we can tell whether the emergency vehicle got a green or not, but not just whether it got it or not, but when it got it. So we can look at this and tell how quickly, if you can move to the right a little bit, um, you can tell how quickly it got the green. Like in this case, um, well, in that one it was already, if you go up to the top for a minute there. Uh, so that one you can see that um, that vehicle hit the light, That that 1572 is the distance from the intersection. Uh, so it first hit the preempt when it was 1500 feet away from the intersection. If you go down two lines where the, the you see the number 10 on the left, that's 10 seconds later. Uh, that's when phases two and five turn green there. So 10 seconds after it um, um, hit the preempt, you can see we got to the green. Now not all intersections respond that quickly. But then you can see that 26 seconds later, um, actually in this case, it turned off its preempt or turned out of that lane. So it didn't go all the way to the intersection in this case. But that's just an example of how we can use that green sense data to analyze how the traffic controller performed in serving that vehicle. And this is actually another report that follows a vehicle. So it says this vehicle, engine number four, 
uh, went through uh, this intersection on the 27th, then went, yeah. you know, uh, this yeah. is a good timeline here, 12, When you do the report by vehicle instead of by intersection, now you can see the chain of intersections that that vehicle progresses through um, and how each one did. And you can see, see, like when you're going through this intersection over here, mm -hmm. um, it took, uh, it first was in phase two and six when he first arrived, 11 seconds later it went to phase three and eight. And then 32 seconds later, he was zero feet from the intersection, just passing the intersection. Mm -hmm. And three seconds later, he was past the intersection and stopped calling an active preempt. And the key there is you can see that it went to the dwell phases and stayed there for the duration of the preempt, which means we know that the traffic controller responded correctly to the preempt call. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> so, you know, one of the things that's really important with all of these um, preemption systems is, you know, what is the time saving? And uh, City of Marietta did a whole study on it, and they came up with it was shaving off 10 to 12 seconds per intersection when they did the study. And they saw that the vehicles were traveling on average through six intersections. So they were saving roughly 60 odd seconds per emergency vehicle trip. And when you speak to the fire department and you speak to the people there, they, they always give a, a really compelling thing that you should think about, which is hold your breath for 60 seconds. And imagine your loved one is sitting there on the ground. 60 seconds is a hell of a long time. So, you know, it's really, really important to, um, you know, look at those kinds of statistics. And what's really important is also what we've done with Marietta. Maybe you want to talk through the constant improvement, because the last time I spoke to the fire chief, he says he thinks we had about a minute and a half savings now. How, do you, how are they doing that, Walt? Uh, just by continually monitoring the system, making sure everything is working. Um, we have monthly meetings with them where we go over issues that we see in the system and uh, just keep tuning it as we go to make sure all the trucks are working correctly and all the intersections are working correctly. And, and they've got a whole uh, way of basically um, <coughs> each time their driver doesn't see a green light, they put in a job ticket. Mm -hmm. And if they don't see a green light, then we basically go in and the city goes in and says, well, why didn't it happen? We look at those reports that Walt is explaining and optimize it so it becomes better and better. So the whole thing is you never sit still. You, you can always optimize these things and just make them better. I've got a short little video that I'm going to show from Chief Milligan uh, that was on the show recently and uh, just explains you know, his view of, you know, how these things have actually been saving time. Here with Chief Tim Milligan from the City of Marietta Fire Department, and we're talking about emergency vehicle response. The fire service is matter. We're always looking for a way to shave time to get to those citizens that need us. We're saving, you know, on average, one minute per call. That's significant. And we really found a challenge to, how do we get these guys to buy and invest into the system, understand what it can do? Let's just say five million dollars for a fire station. Well, we're saving that money because we can meet those response standards now because the preemption system has allowed us that time savings. It's only getting better as we continue to optimize the system. And the important thing there is basically they had a choice of either building more fire stations or utilizing the technology. And what they did was they utilizing the technology and they saved themselves from spending $5 million on a new fire station, which would only have served one little region. It wouldn't have helped the whole area around there. So there's a you know, huge ability of, of um, getting connected um, to provide emergency vehicle preemption with this technology, which is shaving time off, off every single intersection. Um, well, I'm just gonna go grab the, the camera and then uh, we're going to go for a little bit of a walkthrough. Do you want to just talk about, um, as, as we're going to get this camera, is, just give everybody a bit of a background. What is the IATL? Okay. Well, the IATL is just a lab that we built that um, 
where we've collected all the equipment from all the different vendors that we work with. We have examples of all the major uh, traffic controller vendors here. We have different types of traffic cabinets. We have all the connected vehicle equipment, uh, different kind of RSUs and OBUs that we work with uh, so that we can have everything in one place here. And if an uh, auto vendor wants to come in and test you know, with the equipment here, we, we can set up a scenario that they can test with. Perfect. Walt, do you want to take us on a bit of a tour here? <coughs> sure. Let's see. <clears throat> so if we just start, if you look down here, you can see this is where we have all the different brands of traffic controllers. Uh, you can recognize the different colors here. We've got the NASTEC Peak. We've got various Siemens, um, Econolite over here, Intelite in some of these 2070s here, um, Siemens here. Um, <clears throat> also the different types of video camera equipment that we work with and so on also, but uh, connected vehicle equipment, we've got different vendors, OBUs here. Uh, we'll see an RSU in a minute here. Um, and then looking at typical cabinets, of course we've got a NEMA cabinet. Um, Do you want to explain kind of, you know, uh, how you install one of these uh, connected vehicle intersections and just some of the functions of, of what it's doing within the uh, traffic signal cabinet. Sure, why don't we go over and look at the 332 cabinet here. <clears throat> so in the 332 cabinet, of course, you got the controller up here. Our unit goes in here, just a rack mount unit in this case. Um, on the back are all the connections that come. Normally it's a little neater than this. Uh, Ethernet to various things, to the controller to get spat and so on. But then there's also wiring to pick up cabinet flash, cabinet AC voltage in, uh, door opens with just basic cabinet monitoring. It can integrate with the, um, the UPS and so on to monitor. The, the key is we want to make sure everything possible in the cabinet is working so that the emergency vehicle preemption works correctly. If there's something failing in the cabinet, then that emergency vehicle is not going to get a green light. So. That's kind of the idea is to provide immediate alerts to traffic engineers and technicians that there's something going on to make sure that the system is always online and ready to go. And what about, uh, you know, there's, there's two ways I know of, of connecting the emergency vehicle signals. There's one a card rack and one, uh, you know, wiring directly to the back panel. Sure, we have a number of ways actually. So the, the initial way is um, <coughs> there are See these blue wires, they're coming out of a connector on the back of our unit. They can either be wired directly into a cabinet, say an anemic cabinet that has terminal blocks, or we can put one of these cards that acts like a DC isolator, goes into a card slot, and we just bring it in that way. Uh, we can also talk directly to the controller via NTCIP and send the preempt request to newer controllers that way for controllers that support that. And that's both through NTCIP preempt objects as well as the NTCIP 1211 protocol, for which is the new protocol that's being used by for Transit. For TSP, yes. Yeah. And when we come to a cabinet like this, I mean, you know, <coughs> a, a NEMA style cabinet, you obviously are installing and monitoring the power coming yeah, in. Yeah, we're monitoring AC power coming into the cabinet here, various, the flash sense and so on are up in here. Uh, preemption is wired into the side panels here. You can see our green sense wires wired in here right to the outputs of the load switches so that we know for sure exactly what signals the driver is seeing and can log that so that we can see what, what actually the driver saw. Normally this unit would be sitting up on the shelf under the traffic controller, not out like this. This is just how we work on it here. And you're also connected to the conflict monitor where you can monitor the status of that mm -hmm. and to any of the cameras. Now, this same unit we saw in the other intersection was, was connected to some cameras over here. Sure. What are we doing with those cameras? Um, a lot of the customers use uh, video detection and they want to be able to see that. So um, larger cities may have fiber. They can already see that. But a lot of our customers are smaller cities that don't have fiber to the intersection. So we are able to bring the video back over the cellular modem that's in, in the preempt unit here so that they can then see what's going on at the intersection and again, make sure the intersection is operating correctly, uh, especially when the emergency vehicle comes through. And then can you explain to us what kind of antennas get installed on these intersections? Maybe sure. you want to... Um, we can see it on this one. 
Uh, we just use a little surface mount uh, top hat type antenna like this for, that's the 4G LTE antenna. It's also got the GPS antenna in it. And then there's another antenna over here, which in this case is the 900 megahertz radio antenna. That's just the one that we use when we're not doing connected vehicles. Of course, if you're doing the connected vehicle technologies, you'd have some antennas up on a pole above the cabinet. Okay, do you want to maybe uh, explain to the guys what gets installed into the vehicle unit? Sure, if you want to come over here. <coughs> this is the unit that we install in the vehicle. Um, typically only this top part is, this is a test unit that we use here uh, that where the switches simulate the inputs that would be wired into a vehicle. <coughs> so this unit has the uh, connections on the back for the cellular antenna, same antennas you saw over here, cellular antenna, GPS antenna, radio antenna. <coughs> we have a newer unit that has all the DSRC and CV2X antennas on the back also. But its function is just to locate the vehicle like an ABL system and then transmit that uh, location information by whatever means to the preamp system and then to send the inputs from the vehicle uh, whether the vehicle is currently requesting preemption and what the status of its emergency brake and its turn signals are. And this is something that the traffic department can put into their vehicle with a test box to test how the yeah. preemption is working. How is this powered? This is just using a cigarette lighter power adapter that comes with the test unit. So the traffic engineer or the main technician might have a test unit like this so that they can drive test the preamp system and make sure that it's working correctly. And then I see there's some antennas on the window there. Sure. These are the antennas that would normally be mounted on the vehicle. But if you're doing it with a test setup, we either use a suction cup mount like this or just magnetic mount antennas with that test vehicle. And do you want to, I know I explain a little bit more about the GPS technology that goes into this unit um, and how it actually works. Sure. Yeah, and that's actually why this antenna is mounted on the window here because we wouldn't necessarily get a good GPS signal inside the building. But um, the GPS chipset that we use in these units doesn't just do GPS, it also does inertial navigation. It does something called a fusion algorithm where it fuses the GPS information with the inertial information so that if the vehicle is driving through, say, an urban canyon with tall buildings around it and starts losing the GPS signal, it can still maintain an accurate position that it reports to the preamp system so that we still preamp correctly. And when that vehicle pulls into a garage, and maybe the garage doesn't have good cell reception or good GPS reception inside, the GPS chipset um, <coughs> keeps that position in memory intentionally. It remembers where it was even though it doesn't have the GPS anymore so that as soon as it pulls out of the garage, it'll have a fix immediately. It doesn't have to go through that normal 30 second GPS fix period. Well, maybe you want to just walk, as we walk back, is just explain some of the connectivity side of our uh, preemption units and how they provide remote connectivity to the traffic signal controllers and how sure. we do that. Sure. And, and I know we're going to be talking about this in a little bit, but maybe you sure. want to explain how that works. So all the traffic controllers have some kind of ethernet connection on them. It's on the back on these units. Uh, the newer ones may have two, so we may connect to the Ethernet 2 port so that we don't have to be on the city's traffic network. But um, we connect to, um, to that Ethernet port just to get signal phase and timing information from the controller, which we can use just like we use the green sense to record what happens at the intersection during a preempt. But we also use that to provide that uh, signal phase and timing information through the connected vehicle system, through the DSRC or CV2X or our Travel Safely app. Uh, but we can also provide remote access to the controllers, especially as I mentioned, a lot of our customers are smaller cities that may not have central systems. <coughs> if the controller has a remote front panel, uh, we can provide access to that over the cell network through the Glance system so that they can check the programming or correct programming on the controller without actually having to go out on site. And then we also support, obviously, all the major manufacturers Sure. Uh, same tracks, tactics, so that right. if we, a city like Baton Rouge had 460 intersections, we saw there. Right. How many of their signals were on fiber and versus? About, about 200 were on fiber and about 200, 200 and some didn't have comm. So we provided pass-through comm to all the ones that didn't have it. 
and now they're all up on their uh, ATMS.now system. So. And how does it look on ATMS now? I mean, does it just look like any other you intersection? You wouldn't see any difference. It looks like any other intersection. So they can see it on the map. They can do upload, download to it. They can bring up the remote front panel through the vendor system. And, so, and mm -hmm. what about you know video streaming and those kinds of things? I mean, how does that work over Sabia? So <clears throat> we can also connect to the cameras. Here you see it connected to an iTerris system, but any system that can provide streaming video, um, we can pick up that video stream. <coughs> I'm sorry, that's not the Ethernet. This is the Ethernet. But uh, we pick up that video stream and make it available in Glance as a, as a streaming video so that they can then see uh, what what their video detection systems are picking up. And you know, maybe you want to, what kind of video <coughs> detection systems have we actually connected to? So we've worked with Autoscope, we've worked with iTerris, we've worked with um, uh, FLIR. Um, GridSmart. GridSmart. And then uh, what about PTZs? Uh, we, can do, we can do PTZ cameras. We don't have the PTZ control integrated in Glance itself yet, but you can always bring up the camera's web page just like we can bring up the web page of any other device in the cabinet and you can control the camera that way through PTZ. Or if you have something like a GridSmart that has a client software that you need to run to manage that device, we can make that client software reach through the network, through the cell network and manage the device remotely. And then I see obviously all these different intersections on the left and right of you. Have we basically connected to every single one of those manufacturers so we support their central system and their communication to the controller? Yeah. Okay. So, so mm -hmm. that's all the different manufacturers being Interlight and and Peak and Nasdaq and Econolite and Siemens and, yeah. and all the rest of them. All of those. And then what about uh, <laughs> things like battery backups? I see a big battery backup system over here with all the batteries on the ground. Yeah. So what do we do there? Well, we can talk to those through SNMP also, through NTCIP uh, over the network and make sure they're working correctly. <coughs> now with any UPS, we can just wire to its uh, contacts and the battery voltage directly and we monitor that in glance. Again, the object is to make sure that this is working for preemption and for connected vehicles. If you have a battery backup in it but you don't monitor it, you might as well not have a battery backup because it's going to come on, it's going to run for four hours and shut off. If you didn't know that it went on battery, you could have gone out and fixed the power before the battery ran down. But uh, if you don't know, you can't get out there to fix it. So even with the basic analog wiring, we can give you that notice that it is on backup and you need to go fix it. <coughs> but if it's a newer UPS unit that supports Ethernet, now we can monitor it directly over Ethernet instead of having to connect the wires. Plus, we can remotely trigger battery tests on it periodically, run that battery test on it weekly or something, and look at the resulting battery voltages, make sure your battery is in good shape. Because if that battery's been out there three years and you haven't been checking on it, you don't really know if it's going to work when you need it. Perfect, perfect. Well, that was a great tour, Walt. Thanks okay. so much. I think what we'll do is we'll walk back to the chairs there, okay. and, um, and we'll start talking about um, some of the transit applications, as well as... Um, as well as the um, communications and go a little bit more detail. Hey, so, Peter, before you all move on, um, I have one question here. Sure. Awesome. You all touched on this a lot um, here and there, but if you can maybe just summarize, we have someone asking, why should anyone buy an exterior detection system for emergency vehicles when normal camera detection systems can identify them? And why are the two systems not integrated? Um, you know, I mean, yes, you can detect emergency vehicles probably through a camera system, absolutely. But it's going to be very difficult to do the object uh, recognition. So yes, you could do something like that. But the important thing is to trigger the intersections, not just the intersection ahead of you, but it's the intersection ahead of that one so what we're doing often is we're triggering three intersections in advance. We may be 3,000 feet from 3, the intersection. 3,000 feet apart. So <laughs> I think there's a, you know, um, it's all about reliability in the end. And, you know, utilizing a, a GPS uh, signal of the vehicle and cellular and radio gives you flexibility to create multiple different rules and not to have to deploy cameras, you know, all throughout the city to to do the object detection. Any other questions there, Jessica? 
That's all for now. Okay, thank you. So what we're going to do is we're going to go look at, um, you know, uh, the, I think we've spoken about transit quite a bit, and go have a look at inside of the cabinet and what the cabinet unit's doing. So the first thing is obviously doing, we saw the cabinet monitoring. Inside the cabinet, we're monitoring AC, cabinet flash, battery backups, all the different devices in there, temperature and humidity. And then we're doing the pass-through communication, which is, so you can utilize your Centrac system to communicate to the controller or tactics or whatever it is that you're using, or you can access the remote front panel and actually utilize that. The unit does emergency vehicle preemption and it also does connected vehicles, and we'll, we'll have a look at those different things. Walt, do you want to explain some of the things that we're monitoring here? Sure. We were talking about some of these when we were pointing at the cabinet, but um, just things like the AC voltage coming into the cabinet so that we can detect that there's been a power failure. Of course, we log the status of any preempt activities uh, so we can track down what happened after uh, preemption, make sure it worked correctly. We can do time synchronization of the controller or facilitate it through communications with a central system. We talked about monitoring the battery to make sure your batteries in the cabinet are healthy. Uh, and then we just pick up basic cabinet stuff, uh, which sounds simple, but if you don't have a central system and you don't have any way to know about these, these are very useful. That's like whether the cabinet's in flash, whether the door's open, and even as simple as the fan, whether the fan is working or not, is important uh, to know if that cabinet is functioning correctly. Yeah, we've saved a lot of cabinets just from uh, monitoring the cabinet temperature and mm -hmm. the fan and yep. seeing the temperatures going up and the fan's not kicking on. And it's a $5 thermostat that's uh, causing that issue. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you go and replace that $5 thermostat, you're going to save yourself thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, we spoke about this a little bit, which is the glance video. So we're able to stream up to four cameras simultaneously. So you've got your cameras here. And what it's done is it's designed for video on demand. So when you click on a camera, it starts streaming that camera feed, and you can blow this up full screen and whatever, and you can then see exactly what's going on at your intersection, and it'll run this for three to five minutes, and if you want to continue watching it, you just click on a button here, and this way you can do video streaming over cellular reliably without ever having any data overages or anything like that. This is just a great, great feature to utilize, especially if you've got video detection cameras or if you've got PTZs and you don't have fiber at those locations. And the cost of deploying fiber is just astronomical in terms of, uh, you know, uh, getting, getting obviously all of that equipment uh, deployed in the fiber, you know, it's about 30,000 or more per mile. And this gives you a great way of getting all of that connected. The other thing that a lot of smaller cities really like is and not just smaller cities, bigger agencies that have multiple different traffic controllers, is we detect, you know, on our system, uh, detector faults and all the rest. And once they detect something, what the technician does is he jumps into the remote front panel. So it's not a, we're not trying to replace a tactics or same tracks. This is just for agencies that have five, 10, 50 intersections and they don't have the budget to deploy a big uh, central system they can actually access everything straight through a remote front panel. And what's great with this is even if you are a big agency, you can be sitting in your car and the cabinet's snowed in, and you can stay in your warm car and look at you know, exactly what's going on. And it looks identical to the, you know, the front panel. You press the buttons, it works on an iPad uh, or an iPhone, so you can pick up and actually make all the changes and actually read the status over here very, very easily. And we, Walt, what, what kind of uh, traffic controller front panels are we, are we utilizing at the moment? Well, with Siemens, we do the one that, that looks like the front panel like that. Um, they support a, that type of front panel. With controllers that have a web page built in, such as the Econolite, the Inolite, the NASTEC, we can just remote, do remote access to that uh, web page and, and make that available through Glance. So if you were a user, you would zoom into your device on the map, you would click on it, mm -hmm. and then there'll be a link within that device to mm -hmm. open up the remote front panel. Right. And then it would open up another browser for mm -hmm. the Interlite or the NASDAQ or whatever um, right. 
remote frame panel there is. Mm -hmm. Hey, okay. Peter. Yes. Someone's asking, would remote front panel work on an Android? Yes. It's just a web page, so. So yeah, any any web anything that has a web browser. So you would open up Chrome on your Android phone, and you could access uh, the remote front panel. Absolutely. So whether you've got a tablet, generally, I, I personally like to use a tablet when it comes to a remote front panel. It's just a little bit bigger. Um, so. Get, get your city to uh, buy a bunch of tablets so you can change your timing plans on your traffic signal controllers. Yeah, it's a little tight to do that on a phone, but it is possible. So. Yeah, possible, but rather use a tablet to do that. It's just a lot easier, more real estate. Um, Walt, I wanted you to, um, you know, one of the things we obviously do is, is the pass-through communication. So we touched on that when we were walking through there. Mm -hmm which is obviously wirelessly monitoring and controlling the traffic signal controllers. And I mean, obviously the speed of the signals now through LTE, I mean, it's mm -hmm. so fast you can stream video and all the rest. Mm -hmm. um, what, are, I mean, do we, do we see any problems with, you know, doing cabinet controller uploads and downloads? I mean, is it, mm -hmm. How long would it take to do a controller upload download over cell versus over fiber if you were using tactics or same it's, tracks? It's, um, it depends on the controllers and it depends on the technology they're using. But um, you know, on a Centrax system, when they've got FTP available through the network, uh, we can do an upload from the controller in five or 10 seconds, where it might take five seconds over fiber might take 10 seconds over the LTE connection, but um, you know, it's usually pretty quick. Um, so. and, and utilizing mm -hmm. uh, PTZ cameras over cellular, H how does that work? Because I know the streaming mm -hmm. comes through, but what about panning and tilting and zooming? There, there's a little latency there, so you have to be careful using it. And we're doing it with the vendor's web page right now, so you just have to set it up. Um, you know, different locations where these get installed, we may have a higher or lower bandwidth available. So you just kind of have to set your resolution as appropriate for the bandwidth that you have available at that site. And how does the VPN connection work? In other words, obviously security is really important. Um, can you touch just lightly, we don't have much time left, on the security side and how you do a VPN? Sure, the reason we do a VPN is because that makes a secure connection from the cabinet to a central VPN server, which is then connected to the traffic control system or to say a user's laptop if we want if the user wants to be able to log in through their laptop and bring up web pages in the cabinet or connect to other devices in the cabinet that have web pages a VPN gives us a, a secure way to do that and we're now working with a routed VPN capability where the address that you punch into the device in the cabinet is the same address that you use over the VPN so it's easy for the technician say to configure peer to peer between two locations through the VPN just by punching in those those IP addresses in each cabinet and letting the VPN route between cabinets. And so, can mm -hmm. you just touch on the security side of, mm -hmm. of what we're doing on the security side? I know there are multiple different firewalls and things like that and HTTPS sure. encryption. Sure, all the communication from the cabinet unit to the Glance system is secured with HTTPS as is the web page that you log into to use it all the communications such as the pass-through communications we're talking about is heavily encrypted in the VPN and when we create VPNs for customers it's always a unique VPN for that customer so you won't accidentally be on the same network as as other customers controllers and so on it's it's all customized just for each city perfect so, now we've, mm -hmm. we've talked about the connected vehicle aspects and I know we're going to be doing some more on connected vehicles uh, tomorrow in our live mm -hmm. demo but just to give everybody a bit of a taste of, of, of the session that we're doing uh, tomorrow, um, he has a video on, um, on some of the connected vehicle technology. Meet Travel Safely, an app that helps you get where you're going safely. Travel safely works if you're driving, walking, 
biking, wheeling, scooting, or skating. Get real-time audio notifications. Red light. So you can focus on your surroundings. Get notified when you're approaching a red light or when it's time to get ready for green. Get ready for green. Travel Safely works with local emergency vehicles, helping them respond to calls faster. Get notified when an emergency vehicle is approaching. Emergency vehicle front. Or when to share the road with your two-wheeled friend. Cyclist. Vehicle approaching cyclist. Travel Safely tells you when you're passing a school or work zone. And if you need to slow it down. So whether you're on the road or just crossing, pedestrian. Every time you open Travel Safely, you're helping make a better commuting experience for all of us. Together. Download the Travel Safely app today and join our community of users committed to making our roads safer. So you can see, obviously, from a video like that, uh, the emergency vehicle information coming through to the roadway operators, but also the intersections also providing information like get ready for green or you're going to run a red light um, at a signal. And all of that technology is built into this equipment that's provided for emergency vehicle preemption to give the city and the DOT, the agency, more information and more functionality than just the standard preemption system or just the standard connected vehicle system. This is providing a huge number of benefits for the city, the agency, the DOT, the fire department, and the transit agency. So there's a lot of different information coming through. And we're not just connecting up the emergency vehicles and the cars, we're also connecting up pedestrians and cyclists. Biggest increase in roadway deaths in the last 10 years has been what they call vulnerable road users, cyclists and pedestrians. And this is one of those ways of, of getting connected to them and providing them with more information and making the roadway safer for them. Some of the new things that are coming out is bicycles getting priority at signals when a group of bicycle arrive. So there's a lot of new technology coming out with all of this. And what's critically important is that all of the technology that you deploy has got over the air software updates. So all of our devices, whether it's a, a vehicle unit that goes into the vehicle has got over the air software updates or the cabinet units that go into the traffic signal cabinet. So when the features are changing, we can change with them. And um, I think that's a really important thing over there. Walter, my, uh, uh, first of all, any questions that anyone has? Yes, um, about Travel Safely, where can they go to find out what cities it's currently deployed in, Peter? A great question. Um, what you've got to do is if you go, you can either go to the App Store and download Travel Safely and on, on the app stores, it's got a link over there called map.travelsafelyapp.com. And then you can see where all the technology is actually deployed. Awesome. And then one more question. I think we'll talk about this a little bit more in detail tomorrow. But what's currently in the works so that uh, citizens can get alerts um, directly in their cars and get notifications? Okay. I can talk about that a little bit but we've got a certain agreements with car manufacturers that I'm not allowed to talk about. Um, so for instance, in the Ford vehicles, there you can get it on their dashboard using the Ford Sync 3. So if you've got a vehicle with Ford Sync 3, you can get travel safely on your dash. Um, we're working with a couple of other auto manufacturers that I can't speak about um, because of non-disclosure agreements. And then we are also working uh, on releasing a new version of it with Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. So any of your dashboards that have that, it will come directly into the car in that fashion. Perfect. And then one last one here, Peter. Um, how would agency or 
another question just came in, so I lied. That's not the last one. <laughs> um, but how can agencies get um, direct access and notifications for direct communication with the equipment in the cabinets? Um, so they can get, obviously, all that information through the VPN connection. They can get direct access straight through the VPN, as well as they can also, um, you know, all of the data we collecting as well, the connected vehicle data, is available in a, in a real-time feed that we can provide to the agency. Uh, you just give us an IP address and port number and we send you a real-time feed. And then the GLAN system also has APIs that you can integrate into other central systems. So you know, there's multiple ways of getting access to the data. If you're an agency and you want access to everything within your cabinet, it would be through a secure VPN connection and you could have access to all the different IPs within your cabinet. Awesome. And then is there a reoccurring cost associated per signalized intersection with this system or is an uh, umbrella reoccurring cost? So there's no um, kind of yearly cost or anything like that. Generally, most people purchase these devices with five or 10 years of connectivity and support. What that means is we provide the unit with five years of cellular connectivity guaranteed. So if the cell technology changes from 2G to 3G or 3G to 4G, 4G to 5G, we replace the cell modem for free. Then we also provide an unlimited warranty on it. So whatever happens, lightning damage, it's covered under warranty for that five or 10 year period. After the five or 10 year period, all you've got to do is, is um, re-up your five-year or 10-year connectivity and support, and then you get another five years of guaranteed cellular communication and another five years of warranty on the hardware. So what's important about that is we stand behind our hardware and our technology. We expect this to be working for the next 15 to 20 years. And you know that's a big thing that we're putting our name behind is we are actually saying we will continue to service it without any cost to you because we under our service agreement we'll we'll continue to maintain and monitor and provide guaranteed cellular communication so it's a pretty comprehensive uh, plan that we provide with the unit awesome thanks peter and walt perfect well i just want to thank everybody for joining us today thanks so much really appreciate it and thanks so much to the imsa for for hosting the session. It's an absolute pleasure to be broadcasting and thank you, Walt. Great, thanks, Peter. Thanks, Walt. You guys have a great afternoon. Everybody break for lunch. We'll see you back this afternoon. Take care.